Hi, how are you going? Welcome to York Street. We hope and pray that this sermon will be encouraging and fulfill your spiritual needs that you have during this season. So grab a cover, your Bible, and a comfy seat, and let's get into it. Good. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of heading over to the States uh, with a group. We're doing a bunch of conferences and doing a lot of learning, and, and so we're in, in the USA, and, and we're eating as you do in the States. They give you way too much food. It's awesome. And one of the wait- waitresses, um, waiters came up and said, oh, you've got an accent. Where are you from? England. I said, no, 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 we're from Australia. He goes, oh, cool. Say something Australian. And I went blank. Nothing. Just like crickets. You know? Like, I've, I've replayed this conversation so many times. Like, yeah, guy, as a gun. You know, like, you could say so many cool Aussie things. <laughs> But in that, in that time, I just went totally blank. And I was like, oh, hello. You know, nothing, nothing Aussie at all came to mind. I wonder if somebody ever said to you, hey, there's something different about you. I know you're a Christian. How do I get that? What you would say. You ever had those moments where somebody's asked you a spiritual conversation or asked you about your faith and you've just gone blank? It's like... Oh, hello. (laughs) It's like being an Aussie, but not knowing how to speak Aussie. It's like being a Christian, but not knowing how to share the thing that's most important to us with others. So now, if you've ever, ever struggled to have a blank on how to bring good news to a broken world, in what to say, today we're going to start to unpack that over the next couple of weeks. And today we're going to actually look at a really big topic that's actually facing our world about where does our morals come from? Actually, where does God, what has God actually got to do with a world where we can actually be self-sufficient? We actually tackle it at a a very foundational DNA level. But before we do, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We know that you are a good God, a loving God, a God that cares for us, a God that, that, that sent his son for us. So God, we just prayed this morning that you would speak to our core, speak to our spirit and empower us so that we can be able to bring the good news that we hold so true to ourselves to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, for those of you that that are believers, and if you're not a believer today, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for for coming to church. But for those of us that that believe in Jesus and follow him, the the gospel is, is really quite simple. We try and live a good life, but we mess up. That means we're disqualified from going to heaven. Not because God doesn't like us, just we don't meet the bar. So God sent his son to earth, who showed us how to live, to show us how to love, and he actually took the consequence of our wrong things upon himself when he died on the cross. Uh, Our death that we deserve to die and not go to heaven, he died for us so that now we get to go to heaven. Awesome. We, we, We accept Jesus, he sends his Holy Spirit, we're all good. So it's actually quite simple. We mess up. God loves us. He made a way for us to have a relationship with him. Awesome. The only thing with with that gospel message, that good news, the gospel, is that that's a Western filter. And that's fine, but the gospel actually reaches all people. So picture this. In 1962, missionary Don Don Richardson felt called to to share the gospel with the, the Sawi people, the tribe in Western New Guinea in Indonesia. He said about learning the language which was daunting and complex because there's 19 tenses for every verb. He was able to become fluent in the language after studying for weeks and weeks of 8 to 10 hour days, purely studying the language. When Don and his wife Carol uh, arrived amongst the, the Sawi, arrived amongst the people, he found that there was a culture built on warfare, treachery, and deceit between especially two neighbouring tribes, but also others. Particularly concerning was a cultural process known as fattening the pig, whereby a friendship would be sought between two members of the tribe. They would build trust and friendship for the very distinct and, and core purpose of luring the other person into a sense of security, then suddenly killing that person and eating them. The Richardsons were appalled, obviously. 
But as they tried to share the gospel, the good news, and the gospels as we know it, to these people, something even worse took place. Because as they shared the gospel, the hero of the gospel narrative became Judas. Because Judas earned the trust of Jesus before betraying him so he'd be murdered. And because of their culture, he was elevated to this point of, of high regard. Finally, the Richardsons decided to leave because they just could not break through with their version of the gospel, their, their way of understanding who, who, um, how much Jesus loved them and how to communicate that. As they went to leave, to their astonishment, the tribes were motivated to pre- prevent them from leaving And so the tribes brought out, there's two tribes brought out a baby each. And each tribe gave a baby to the other tribe. The Richardsons were concerned because these were known cannibals and they thought that this was going to be a child sacrifice. But then to their amazement, they saw that these babies were called the peace child. In essence, it was a covenant between the two tribes. And if... Any, while these two babies grow up, there would be peace between the two tribes. And if anything was to ever happen to these babies, it was seen as the most evil of evil things, the, the most ultimate sin. These babies were to be free and, and never to be um, treated as the, the fattening the pig culture and, and custom that they had. And in essence, it was peace. Don and Carol prayed and suddenly the penny dropped. They explained to the two tribes that Jesus was God's peace child. And he was killed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1.19. All of a sudden, Judas was no longer the hero and the Sawi people became Christians in large numbers. For you and I, the gospel is clear. But for sometimes people outside of the church, outside of the culture that we've grown up with, the gospel can be a little bit more complicated. Sometimes the gospel needs more unpacking. What is being taught uh, to to this next generation actually has a different understanding of what the foundation of, of life is, where our morals come from, where our values come from. And today we're actually going to talk about a very foundational thing of where do our morals, where do our values actually come from? And so we're going to look at a really deep question today, which actually becomes quite a foundational question when it comes to our faith journey. Today I'm going to do some teaching and preaching. I'm going to talk about a a bit of a complex topic and then we're going to switch that around and talk about a gospel message at the end and, and sort of bring it in. So it's a bit of teaching, a bit of preaching. Today we're going to talk about can good exist without God? Can good exist without God? It's quite a complex sort of thing. You see, if God does not exist, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? Without God, objective moral values don't exist. See, this idea of objective moral values means that there is a very fixed point in which we get our morals from. And there's two things we're going to look at. One is objective, and the other one is subjective. So we're going to slip a couple of, skip a couple of slides. Thanks so much. And this idea of objective and subjective works a little bit like this. For example, I'm going to ask you to point up. Which way is up? Excellent. Most of you know. A few people don't, but most of you got that correct. Good job. Now, it's objective which way is up because you know, that we're, we've got things that we can get our bearings from. We can see the horizon, we can see the, the ground, we, we feel gravity, we know that's upwards. While we're in Australia, that could be arguing. But anyway, yeah, we know which way is up, right? Now, it's coming into summer, and I love the beach. I love swimming. I'm not a big fan of sand, but I love the water. It's awesome. But there's been a few times when I go swimming where a wave will knock me around. And it's only happened a couple of times where I've, I've been tossed around by a wave and I'm all over the place and I've gone to stand up and I've put my leg out to stand up and all of a sudden I think, I am so much deeper than what I thought it was. I can't touch the ground. Like, like and a little bit of panic. And so in that panic, you sort of do that really elegant thing because no one can see you underwater where you try and swim up. It's kind of like, 
yeah, you're trying, you're trying to like do this swim thing. Like, it's like, I've got I to gotta, I gotta get up. Only to realize that when I do that, I touch the ground. And then I stand up and I'm up to here in the water. <laughs> so for a moment, there's this fully grown man in the sideways in the water going... <laughs> now, in that moment, though, I totally disorientated. If you were to ask me which way is up, even though I'm totally parallel, I would have said that way is up because I'm on my side. I'm disorientated. I don't know where to get my bearings from. My, my subjective reality for me in that moment says that up is this way. It's subjective because I'm all out of whack. As soon as I touch the sand, it becomes objective because there is a concrete thing that I cannot irrefute that says this is the foundation. As soon as I stand up into water this high, whatever it was, I go, ah, oh, there's the horizon. Oh, there's another wave coming. Ah. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a bearing. Subjective morality means that our morals are subjective to the individual. Our, our morals are, are our own rather than having a firm foundation which we're all unified by. For example, if I was to say, put your hands up for this too, who likes ice cream? And more people like ice cream than know which way's up. That's awesome. All good. Now, if I was to ask you what your favourite flavour of ice cream is, any volunteers, what's your favourite flavour? Yep. Mint choc chip. Wow, it's like getting two flavours. The best. Mint and choc chip. Yep. Mango. Oh, healthy ice cream. It's good. Yep. Licorice. It's like getting ice cream and some other thing and... Why? But it, it's okay. It's all good. That's okay. Any others? Yep. Rainbow. Is that the one that's like bright colored and like stains your insides? Fantastic. Amazing. Rainbow. I love old English toffee. Like, mm, so good. But that, um, what's it? Caramel, sea, rock sea salt, rock salt caramel is slowly approaching Old English toffee. Rock salt caramel, I don't know. It's all, oh, it's the best. But ice cream flavor is subjective. You, you couldn't say that, hey, everyone should like licorice. That's okay if you, if you like licorice, but, but it's subjective. We all have our own, or rainbow flavor. We all have our own flavors that we like. It's subjective to the individual. Now, sadly, The world without God, our moral compass becomes subjective. Actually, one of our our leading thinkers in the world actually says this. Richard Dawkins says, Without God, there is no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. You see, without God, we are all here by random chance. Isn't it crazy to think that? You look at the beautiful weather today outside. You look at this, this incredible building that we've been able to make with incredible materials that God has provided in our world. We're wearing, you know, I'm not saying that I've dressed well, but we're wearing clothes that are incredibly crafted by people. We've got amazing intellect. We're, we, you know, life is so amazing. This is more than chance. But the world says if, we, if there's no God, we're here by chance. Therefore, you are just an animal. And yes, you're a higher species of animal that can think, but any action you do is just animal instinct. Therefore, a cat chasing a bird is not, a, not good or bad, it's just animals doing what animals do. Dog chasing a cat, it's just what animals do. Person hurting a person, it's just what animals do. Person doing abuse is just what animals do. You see, there's no moral compass. Everything is subjective. And what is right for me and the ice cream I like is no one can tell me if it's any different. No one can tell me which way is up if I'm lying sideways because my reality is my reality. And who are you to tell me that my reality is wrong? Subjective moral compass. And this is what is out in the world. People are lying sideways in the water. They don't know which way is up. Their moral compass is out of whack because they don't have a fixed point. You see, when we look at God, we get a fixed point. God's nature is expressed in his commands. God's nature is expressed in his commands. So God says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does this look like when we get a fixed point? 
Well, firstly, we see that the God's nature says there is generosity, there is sacrifice, and there is equality. Love your neighbor as yourself. If that is God and that is good, generosity, sacrifice, and equality. The opposite would be generosity, um, greed. The opposite of sacrifice would be abuse. The opposite of, of equality would be discrimination. Good and bad. The things of God are good. The things without God are bad. So what we start to see is, is that if God does not exist, then why, as humanity, as people across the world, are there things that we're unified by rather than being individual when it comes to what is right and what is wrong? Why is it that when we see somebody that has no food sitting on the side of the road, something in us immediately goes, I don't carry coins anymore. I don't. But why is there something in us like, I want to help? Why is it that people in Ballarat pack boxes full of goods at Christmas time and deliver them to a place to give to someone that they will never meet? That is not animal instinct to care for someone that's not a part of your pack, your family. It doesn't make sense for us to do things to help people that we will never get the benefit from. That's not animal instinct. It's not survival of the fittest. There is something in us that is inexplainable without God. There is something in us that drives us to do things. And we see it all the time. We see somebody helping a child, maybe on the soccer field where they've got an un, un, a shoelace that's, that's untied, and, and the referee will do up the kid's shoelace. Why? Is that helping the other team? Like, what is that? What is it? Or is it just something in us that has to do good? You see, if there is a, a moral objectivity of, of how we are to treat others that comes from God, there's also moral actions that we have to, fo- have to follow that also come from God. And I see it all the time. I see that there's so much proof that people want to do good that people want to help, that it just points to, hey, there is, a, there is a compass, there is a foundation that actually unifies us, that's bigger than self, that actually brings us together, that as a country and as people everywhere, we go, hey, there's wars overseas that we're not happy with. It doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect what you have for breakfast. It doesn't affect what you'll do tomorrow. You may not even know people that are over there. But there's something in you that goes, there is something really wrong over there and I'm just going to pray for them. We know what is right, we know what is wrong because there is a God whose character sets the standard for all humanity. Even if you don't acknowledge who he is, he sets a standard for us to do what is right and care for others and know what is wrong. And so when it comes to a point where we get to be with somebody else, who is on this journey of, of exploring life. When we come to this point where, where somebody wants to, to open up, like, what is, why are you so nice? Why are you doing all these good things? Why are you so positive all the time? And usually it's because the closer we are to God, the closer we are to good. The further we are from God and choosing to do self, the closer we are to the selfish things are the things that are, that are bad. Greed, generosity. And so when it comes to us as followers of Jesus having a conversation with somebody else about how to enter this journey of being a follower of Jesus, I want to give you the most simplest thing that you can say. I want to equip us firstly to understand that, that if God exists, there is good in the world. And you don't even have to be a Christian to be doing good to acknowledge that God exists. Without God, there is indifference. And we're not indifferent. Everybody seeks to help others. Even though we we wrestle with the government, I don't think any government sets out to destroy the country. You can have different political views, but each government wants to help people, wants to improve things. They want to do good. They have different perspectives, but they want to do good. They want to help. Good shows that there is a God. So how do we show people who God is? Well, firstly, 
God's character is shown through John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall never, not perish but have eternal life. We know that God loves us. We know God made a way. Why did God have to make a way? Well, in Romans 3.23, we know that we will fall short of God's standard. God has a standard for us to live by. God made us. God wants us to, do a, a, you know, to, to be in relationship with him. But because we've messed up, we don't make the standard of perfection. That's why God sent his son down to earth. That's why God sent Jesus to earth to to take our consequences upon himself so that we could be restored to him. And Acts 3.28 says that, that Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that sits in us and helps us to do good is the voice that, that helps us be more like God and have those God flavors in our interactions and, and, and conversations and in our character when we're at work or at home. And so I want to teach you the, the, the simplest thing that you can say with somebody that maybe is on the journey. It says, I've seen you just be so positive. I've seen you be so loving. I see you do this. I see you do that. What is so different about you? How do I get what you've got? You know, sometimes we go, oh, I need a pastor for this, or I need a book, or I haven't got a course, or um, I, I know it's in, maybe it's in the back. Is it in the back, um, printed in 1860? Oh, man, I'd, yeah. Simplest thing is this. I want to make it so simple. I'm going to give you one word. If somebody's looking for Jesus, simply get them to ask. It can be as simple as this. If someone wants to know who Jesus is, if someone wants to know more about what God is, say, hey, would you pray this prayer? God, I ask you to show yourself to me. Amen. Simple. Is there more to the story? Absolutely. But this is the start of the story, not the end. There's a journey to be taken. You don't start at the destination. You don't have to have it all together. It's like baptism. You don't have to have your life all sorted before you're baptised. You believe... And you're baptised. It's not you believe and you're baptised. It's, it's all together in the Bible. You just do it. Ask. If someone's searching for God, don't miss the opportunity. Ask. If someone sees good in your life, don't, don't miss the opportunity. Say, hey, I want, to share, I want to share why I do good. It's because I've got a relationship with Jesus. Tell me about that. Well, are you really interested? Yeah. Well, why don't you ask him to show himself to you? How do I do that? Pray this prayer. Jesus, show yourself to me. Amen. Ask. If you, want to, if you want to expand on it a little bit more, remember, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, you can say sorry. That's, the first, that's a great part to start. You can say sorry, I've done the wrong thing. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son to die on a cross for your sins, so thank him for that. And then the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us, so we ask the Holy Spirit to fill us. You can expand on it. I want to finish with a story, which is scriptural. It's it's where Jesus uses this moral foundation to... to, And this is where it all sort of ties together. So if you've been a bit lost, this will land it, okay? We follow on okay? It's a bit of a heavier topic this morning. (laughs) Moral objectivism. What did you learn about today? Uh, Something about ice cream. (laughs) It's a bit of a heavy one. But it ties together here because this is how Jesus lived a life and led others to accepting what salvation looks like. Remember, Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. So how do you say thank you for dying on the cross when Jesus is still alive? What is the good news when Jesus is alive? And the good news is that God's character is good. God's character is a better way to live. God's moral compass is a fixed point for us to focus on. And so this is what Jesus does, and we're going to pull this apart really Really quickly, not because it's, it's worth doing quickly, it's worth doing, but just because of time. Jesus entered Jericho, Luke 19, and was passing through. We know, for those, most of us will know this story. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. Tax collectors were known for, for stealing stuff and, and ripping people off. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran 
He ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming by that way. Verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. What was Jesus' first point of interaction with Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus the thief, the Zacchaeus the sinner, Zacchaeus the person that had, had been stealing from people, Zacchaeus that was being dishonest, Zacchaeus the liar. What was Jesus' first interaction with him? Love your neighbour as yourself. Equality. I see you. I value you. I accept you. I love you. Come down, I want to eat with you. Equality, equal. That was the entry point. Zacchaeus welcomed him gladly. Something happened in Zacchaeus' spirit because God's love, God's kindness was just shown by Jesus' action of accepting him. Verse 7, we get the opposite, the crowd. The people saw this and began to mutter, who is going, who's going to be the guest of a sinner? Judging. Judging. This discrimination of, of us and them. And, and some of them have been hurt and some of them have been wrong and you can understand that, but, but there's, a, there's a crowd. But we see the change in Zacchaeus' spirit immediately because of Jesus' action. In verse 8, but Zacchaeus stood up and said, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because of this man too is a son of Abraham. Equality once again. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus' entry point was caring for somebody else, seeing somebody else, loving somebody else. And I want you to know that us as Christians, when it comes to bringing good news to a broken world, it just comes from our actions. It's the foundation. Good exists because God exists. Good exists because we have a foundation of good, a foundation of God that dictates how we treat other people. And so today I want you to know there's three things. Firstly, will you accept the good news? If you haven't accepted the good news of Jesus Christ, it's really simple. Ask. If you don't know who Jesus is, God, will you show yourself to me? Jesus, will you show yourself to me? Amen. It's so simple. Start there. Please let someone know. We would love to journey with you, give you a Bible, show you how to read it, unpack what it, what it means to be on this journey because God loves you so much. Will you accept the good news? Secondly, will you live the good news? As Christians, we are called to do good because God is good. It's his character. It's his nature. Care for people, see people, encourage people. I had a conversation with someone after our nine, our nine o'clock service that said, you know what I need to do this week? I need to say thank you more. That was their takeaway. I need to be a more appreciative of other people. I've become complacent in the workplace and I need to say thank you more. God's spirit spoke to him and there's an action that he's going to take back to his workplace. Because it's God's character. The closer to God, the closer to good, the more that we will do because God is good. So will you live the good news? Will you be light in the darkness? Will you be the God flavors, the salt of the earth, the God flavors in the interactions with others? And will you share the good news? When someone says, I see something, why do you do that? And when they ask the question, will you be courageous enough to say, hey, it's because of Jesus. Let's bring the good news to a broken world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that goodness only exists in this world because of you. Lord, that every time somebody is kind to someone else, even if they don't know who you are, they declare your existence by that deed. God, we pray that we would be known by the way that we love one another as your church. And in doing so, we would draw others to you because of the goodness that is elevated by our love of you. The goodness that comes from a place of us trying to be more like your son. And Lord, would we be bold enough to be able to share the good news with those around us? God, we know that there are people that aren't destined for heaven at this moment because they don't know who you are. 
Would you well up inside us a passion and an urgency to share the good news with others? God, would you do it in a way that we would see our friends, our families, our neighbours and our co-workers be able to understand that good comes from you and that there is hope and a purpose for them that comes through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon. We hope and pray that you are able to receive something from God during this time. If you are interested in having a look at our sermon-based studies, please visit our website at www.yorkstreet.com.au or check the description below for a link. And if you enjoyed the video, please share, like and subscribe to keep updated. And as you go out, have a blessed and joyous week. God bless. Thank you.